Please stand for our call to worship, followed um, by our opening hymn, number 35. The Lord leads us like a shepherd. God nourishes our lives and restores our souls. The Lord is with us, even in the darkest valley. Mercy are always close. Let's sing hymn 35. Jesus calls us to enter the joy of discipleship, the joy of following in His way. But sin clings closely, and we struggle to respond fully to Christ's invitation. Let us seek God's forgiveness corporately and then in private so that we may know more deeply the joy God intends. God of perfect love, You continually bring forth life, transforming sadness to joy and despair to hope. We are weak, but you are strong. Our ways are flawed, but your ways are true. We are seldom right, but you are never wrong. Forgive us, redeem us, transform us. Take away the sin that burdens us, and restore us to the people you would have us be. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Relentlessly, God seeks us out. With abundant grace and boundless mercy, God seeks us out. This is good news. Our sins are forgiven. We are restored to the body of Christ. Please be seated. With gratitude for God's faithfulness and with thanksgiving for all that we have received, let us now bring our gifts to God.
Let's pray. O God, with faith and hope, we offer these gifts. Use them even as you use us to accomplish your purposes in Jesus Christ, the head of the church and the Lord of our lives. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, illumine these words by your Spirit that we might hear what you would have us hear and be who you would have us be. For the sake of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the 22nd chapter of Matthew verses 1 through 14. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call all those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent his other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I prepared my dinner, my oxen and fat, my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him out into the inner darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Well, I'm happy to be here today, and I do enjoy filling in when Ron has to be out, but I am learning a valuable lesson. Before I agree to fill in for him next time, I must first check the lectionary. It seems the last few times I've been dealt some challenging text to preach on. I could have chosen another passage, but what's the fun in that? With this passage from Matthew, we find ourselves in what Jill Duffield, the former editor of Presbyterian Outlook, calls Parabolus Horribilis. In these last few weeks of parables, Matthew has not been one to shy away from uh, violence, and he continues that trend with today's passage. We start with a very nice story. God is like a king having a party, and who doesn't like a good party? He's invited people to come, and they should have been happy to have been invited. But some don't want to come because they apparently have better things to do. So God invites them again. This time they're getting upset at the persistent nagging, so some of them beat up and kill those who brought the invitations. Well, this nice story has taken a turn, hasn't it? If you don't want to go to the party, then don't go. But you don't have to kill, kill the postman for bringing the invitation. God, being a patient and understanding God, forgives and forgets. No, wait, he doesn't. Our God, the one who is abounding in steadfast mercy and is slow to anger, goes ballistic. He has his former guest who killed the messenger sent to their deaths as well. That dirty do deed being done, there's still a party to have, so God sends out more invitations. This time inviting the good and the bad to his party. They show up. Things are looking good. Until God notices someone who isn't dressed appropriately and has him tied up and tossed out into the outer darkness. Well, so far, this isn't a very comforting story. Perhaps there's comfort in the moral. Let's see. Many are called, but few are chosen. Nope, missed that one too. What's Matthew up to here? What are we supposed to get out of this parable, out of this allegory? Be careful how we dress. Never bail on a party invitation. Don't get uppity just because we're called, because we may not be chosen to the in, in the end. This story is a real bummer. The context of the story is important to remember, and it does follow previous parables. In his book, Matthew and the Margins, Warren Cook summarizes it this way. The parable is an allegory that continues the symbolism of the parable of the wicked tenants from last week's lectionary reading. The king is God, and he has a son, Jesus. The king sends slaves, prophets, several times to invite the people, the religious leaders, to the wedding feast, the eschatological age, but they kill the slaves, anticipating the passion. The sentence is handed down as Rome destroys the city, Jerusalem, in 70 CE. God acts as an imperial tyrant. The disciples are supposed to invite others, namely the elite, but they too will face judgment. That helps, doesn't it? This is an unlikely story. It's hard to imagine people killing messengers just because they came with an invitation to a party they didn't want to attend. It's hard to accept that after begging people to come, sending messengers to invite the good and the bad to the party, that the host would then toss out someone who wasn't dressed appropriately. But that doesn't mean there's nothing to the story. What we see here is Jesus' ongoing attempts to point out where the religious leaders of the day were wrong. He never backs down. He never stays away from a confrontation. He never gives up. Yet he doesn't just argue to be difficult. Unlike many other parables that were being told to the disciples, this one is being told to the religious leaders, to the Pharisees. They're the ones who think they have all the answers 
and believe the problem is with Jesus, not with themselves. They see themselves as the Israel of old, the keepers and followers of the law. But Jesus is once again trying to point out that the law is being fulfilled through him, that there is a different way now, and they continue to ignore him. The first guests invited to the wedding were the old Israel. They were invited to come and see the new king and the new groom, but instead they chose not to come. They had other business to attend to, other things to do, other places to be. As one commentary pointed out, invitations back in the day were handled differently. There were no clocks, so invitations were initially sent prior to the event, perhaps like a save-the-date card. And it allowed everyone to talk and find out who else had been invited. It's very much a shame and fame culture. So if the wrong people were going, or if the right people weren't going, then others could decide whether to attend or not. No one wanted to be at a party with the wrong people. Once things were ready, the slaves, the messengers, were once again sent to tell everyone that things were ready and it was time to come to the party. Yet it seems that once the preparations had been made, most everyone had suddenly found other things to do. We know that the so-called common people, the good and the bad, would be invited later in the story. So we can assume that those initially invited were the upper class, the elite, the leaders, the movers and the shakers in the town. Surely guests knew that the best people had been invited. So it seems unlikely they would have decided not to go because of who else was invited. Now, they must have decided not to go because of who the host was. They determined that they had better things to do than grace the king with their presence. It begs the questions of who do we choose to not show up for today? Who are the people in our lives that we don't think deserve our presence, our attention, our support? What parties are thrown that we choose not to attend? How many excuses can we come up with to not go where we've been invited? God certainly passed judgment on the people He had chosen first to attend His party and then turned around and invited others, the good and the bad, the common people, the people who for some reason weren't invited the first time. We saw the same thing in last week's lectionary reading, the parable of the wicked tenants. God took the vineyard away from them when they refused to fulfill their obligation and gave it to others. In this parable, we also see the judgmental aspect of God, but we also see his never-ending attempts to reach us. Rather than cancel the party, he reached out again to other people to join him. We're reminded of this through of the subtle interrelation of grace of election, God's constant effort and will to have a people and the resulting obligation of us in having a faithful and grateful response. We have been offered grace, but we must live according to that grace. We don't talk much about election anymore, but it's still a tenet of our Reformed Presbyterian tradition. One of the reasons I think we shy away from it is because of the danger of thinking that if we've already been chosen, then we can sit back, think we have it made, enjoy life on easy street. This parable, however, clearly shows that's not the case. Even if we are chosen, even if we are among the elect, we still have an obligation to live according to grace and to do God's will. This parable also brings up another point of our Reformed tradition that differs from what our friends and other denominations might believe. Those invited to the wedding party didn't need to accept the invitation to the party to fulfill their election. They had already received grace. 
It's an important point here. One that I think we too often miss. We don't have to do anything to receive God's grace. We don't have to accept it. We don't have to ask for it. We certainly don't have to earn it. It's already given to us. Completely free of charge. We don't have to accept the invitation. What we have to do is respond to that grace. Our obligation is to respond according to the grace we have been given and to go to the party, not as payment, not as acknowledgement, but because we're changed by the grace we've been given. Those who initially refused to attend the party suffered not because they broke, not because they refused to accept God's grace. They suffered because they broke the covenant with God by not being obedient. But there's still a troubling aspect of this parable. Even after the invitation was extended to the second group of people, even after the room was filled with guests, the king noticed one person who was not dressed appropriately. One of the questions we have to ask is, what did the king expect given these people were invited at the last minute? Surely he could have shown a little leniency and overlooked some inappropriate dress. But we have to look further. Everyone in the room had been invited at the last minute. Yet only one was noticed to not be dressed appropriately. How did the others manage to make themselves acceptable? And this one person didn't. Clearly they must have taken a few minutes to change clothes before they arrived at the party even on short notice, but this one seemingly came straight from the fields in his work clothes. There are various theories about how the man was found to be underdressed. Some even proffer that host of that time would have provided robes for the event, and the man chose not to wear one, but there may not be too much evidence for that argument. Augustine took the wedding garment to symbolize love, Luther took it to be faith. Calvin assumed it was both faith and works. However, to the early Christians, given their knowledge of the scripture and the events and customs of the time, it would have symbolized their baptism garments. This is all allegory for not being clothed in Christ, for not wearing righteousness as provided by God. Our baptism signifies being made different, being remade. And this one guest apparently had not been made different. We need to also note that when asked why he wasn't dressed, the guest was speechless. He had no explanation, no justification, no reason for why he was the only one out of the many who was not appropriately dressed. Perhaps there's something in not being able to justify yourself that we should note as well. I had a colleague once who worked as hard and as much as the rest of us, but he got crosswise with our director. One day he was asked what he did for the organization, and while I could have given a dozen things that he did for us, he replied, nothing. He left us within the month. I thought it was a mistake, so I asked our director about it, and he told me that he would have let him stay if he had only been able to answer the question. Was that the problem with the party guest? Was it not so much how he was dressed, but that when asked about it, he couldn't give an answer? It does give us pause to think about how we would answer that question. If God asked us what, what we had done for him, how would we answer? Could we answer? Regardless of the extent of our biblical knowledge or our knowledge of history, all we have to know is that God demands everything from us. Our soul, our life, our all. We can't take the call of God lightly. We can't neglect it. And we can't respond to the call carelessly. When we oppose the work of God in the world, we suffer the consequences of God's judgment. 
Following God, just as accepting the invitation to the wedding, comes with some hefty responsibilities. Our come-as-you-are culture, combined with our please-just-come attitude we have in many churches today, doesn't remove that responsibility from us. To come and truly eat and drink with Jesus requires that we leave behind what we have and that we come thoughtfully and that we intentionally bring our very best to his service. That's a tough sell, especially in these times of instant gratification and attitudes of what's in it for me that we see throughout society. But serving God has never been easy. It's much easier for us to create our own gods. Money, sports, work, others. That we can control ourselves than it is to follow Jesus and surrender control to Him. Are we perfectly dressed to meet our Maker? No, of course we're not. In our kinder and gentler age, we have come to think of God as our grandmother, someone who is always happy to see us no matter when we come, how we come, or how we dress. She's just happy to see us. But this parable tells us that this is absolutely not the case with God. He may love us, but He's not our grandmother. But we can't leave it there. We can't just stop and note that God gets angry, that God gets even, and that we will never on our own be acceptable to Him. God wants us as we can see in who He invited to this party. He invited the well-to-do, the not-so-well-to-do. He invited the good and the bad. We need to be continually reminded that Jesus ate with religious and civic leaders as well as with prostitutes and thieves. None of us are worthy of the invitation, but we're given the invitation anyway. And we need not worry about being properly dressed for the party because in our baptism we have been clothed with God's righteousness through the sacrifice of His Son. In the not-too-distant future, we will all be asked to make pledges of our time, our talents, our money to the church. And knowing that God has, what God has equipped us with, we should all feel emboldened to say yes to God no matter when or where He calls us to serve Him. When Jesus called the disciples, they dropped their nets and followed. When God calls us, we should drop everything and follow. But we should never expect to remain unchanged. We will not be the same at the end of the journey with God as we were at the beginning. When we're called by God, our job is to answer, not to ask questions. If God is calling you to do something, to serve somewhere, your response should be a simple yes. But how often do we make excuses? That's not my thing. I don't have the experience. I've never done that before. Surely there are others who could do a better job. When God calls, He will provide us with what we need. He will change us. This parable occurs elsewhere in Scripture, but Matthew puts an addendum to it. Matthew adds, For many are invited or called, but few are chosen. In the end, it's God who makes the choice, not us. Matthew extends this judgment not just to Judaism, but also to the church of today. There's good and bad in the church today, and we need to locate ourselves within this parable. Where do we fit? We're certainly not the king or the son, but are we the many or are we the few? This is not something we should worry too much about or be fearful of, but we should be reminded that in the end, it's God who will choose. God will be the one to judge us and our neighbors. We are not the ones to judge. God is. God has offered His grace to us all through His Son. Our most selective universities in the nation have acceptance rates below 10%. Even our public universities run around 60%. Yet God has an acceptance rate of 100%. God has invited us to a banquet. How do we handle that invitation? Do we take it lightly 
Or do we consider what God is asking of us? God sent his messengers out into the streets, to the margins of society, to invite the good and the bad to his wedding banquet. Where are the margins we know about and can work in? We shouldn't live in fear of God's judgment, but we do need to acknowledge it. We should remember one of the lessons from last week's parable of the wicked tenants. God is not going to ask us what we preserved. He's going to ask us what we have produced. Amen. Let's pray. Great God, in you is more love than we can imagine and more grace than we can fathom. You have shown yourself in Jesus Christ as a God who meets us where we are and loves us as we are. We are glad for this day and grateful for your many gifts. You bring good things into our lives, more than we can name, more than we can number. You give us the bread of life, sustaining our souls and feeding our deepest hungers. You accompany us on our way. Thank you for your abundant faithfulness. Our hearts are full with many things today. Disease and death and pain and sorrow are constantly among us. The journey through these days is marked by uncertainty and heartache. We are frequently overwhelmed by the needs around us and within us. Some need healing. Some need encouragement. Some need comfort. Some need assurance. And we all need hope. So we turn to you, asking you to hear our prayers and grant what we need for the living of these days. We pray for our nation. We pray for renewed commitments to our common life. Refresh us in the values of your heart. Justice, righteousness, compassion, mercy, peace. Help us to find a unity of purpose as citizens and neighbors. We pray for your church in places near and far. May the waters of your grace continually refresh and empower us to extend the love of Jesus to all people. We pray for the Presbyterian Church USA for the clarity of our witness and the success of our mission. We pray for our congregation, for our life together, and for our efforts to follow in the way of Jesus. Hear us, hold us, heal us, help us. For the sake of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will you please stand as we confess what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Our sending hymn is number 39, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Let us go from this place trusting that God is with us and for us in every place. May the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you this day and forevermore. Shalom.